The second lesson I drew from the painting comes from the bowed head of the Air Force officer. Many in the military services are devout. For them, their faith is an important and sustaining part of their lives in the military. Many others find less importance in religion or no importance at all, and this is equally respected. But devout or not, every soldier, sailor, airman, or marine pledges his or her allegiance to our Constitution and to the values protected by that founding document. The officer's bowed head reminds us that American military power, indeed any use of force by our nation, should always be subordinated to our laws and values. Without such subordination, our power, for, our power is purposeless and unconstrained and may become illegitimate. In response to the 3,000 murders on September 11, our nation went to war. In Afghanistan, our targets were the al-Qaeda perpetrators and the Taliban regime that aided and abetted them. In Iraq, the target was an unstable tyrant who had a history of using chemical weapons and who could be trusted to cheat and retreat from his international commitments. As Navy General Counsel, I supported both engagements. As a private citizen, I support them still. I regard each as a prudent and even necessary use of force. The terrorist threat and the threat posed by weapons of mass destruction in reckless hands can never be underestimated. I subscribe to Deputy Secretary uh, of Defense Gordon England's view that the only reason why Al-Qaeda killed 3,000 individuals on 9-11 is because they couldn't kill 3 million. These threats dictated an aggressive response, and President Bush and our nation responded appropriately. And yet, there are times in our nation's history when, in our quest for security, our fear momentarily overcomes our judgment and our power slips the discipline of law and our national values. One such moment occurred in 1942 following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. In what will always be regarded as a moment of national shame, military authorities rounded up 120,000 American citizens of Japanese ancestry and incarcerated them on the presumption of disloyalty. These citizens were stripped of their rights and held in detention camps for the duration of the war. Many lost businesses and property. When we recall this event, and it is relevant to our situation today, we also recall with shame the Supreme Court's abdication of its judicial responsibilities in the notorious Korematsu decision, where it endorsed the legality of this patently unconstitutional detention. Korematsu reminds us that when threats and fear converge, our laws and principles can become fragile. They are fragile today. In the summer of 2002, 60 years after Korematsu and only four years ago, at Guantanamo and elsewhere, U.S. authorities held in detention individuals thought to have information on other impending attacks against the United States. Unless this information was obtained, it was believed more Americans, perhaps many more Americans, would die. In this context, our government issued legal and policy documents providing, in effect, that for some detainees labeled unlawful combatants, interrogation methods constituting cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment could be applied under the President's constitutional commander-in-chief authorities. Although there is continuing debate as to the details of how, when, and why, we know such cruel treatment was applied at Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and other locations. We know the treatment may have reached the level of torture in some instances. And there are still questions as to what the relationship of these policies was, if any, to the deaths of several dozens of detainees in custody. It is astonishing to me, still, that I should be here today addressing the issue of American cruelty, or that anyone would ever have to. Our forefathers, who permanently defined our civic values, drafted our Constitution inspired by the certainty that law could not create, but only recognize, certain inalienable rights granted by God to every person, not just citizens, and not just here, but everywhere. These rights form a shield that protect core human dignity. Because this is so, the Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel punishment, the constitutional jurisprudence of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments outlaws cruel treatment that shocks the conscience. The Nuremberg Trials, that triumph of American justice and statecraft, 
that launched the era of modern human rights and international criminal law treated prisoner abuse as an indictable crime, and the Geneva Conventions forbid the application of cruel and human and degrading treatment to all captives, as do all of the major human rights treaties adopted and ratified by our country during the last century. There should have been no doubt or ambiguity about the standard of conduct that our laws require of us. And even if laws have jurisdictional limits, there could have been no doubt about what our values forbade. Despite this, there was abuse. Not all were mistreated, but some were. For those mistreated, history will ultimately judge what the precise quantum of abuse was, whether it was torture or some lesser cruelty, and whether it resulted from official commission, omission, or whether it occurred despite every reasonable effort to prevent the abuse. Whatever the historical judgment, However, it is established fact that the documents justifying and authorizing the abusive treatment of detainees during interrogation were approved and distributed. These authorizations rested on three beliefs. First, that no law prohibited the application of cruelty. Second, that no, no law should be adopted that would do so. And third, that our government could choose to apply the cruelty or not as a matter of policy depending on the dictates of perceived military necessity. Some officials may also have believed that if this abuse were disclosed or discovered, virtually no one would care. The resulting but inescapable truth is that no matter how circumscribed these policies were, or how short their duration, or how few the victims, for as long as these policies were in effect, our government had adopted what can only be labeled as a policy of cruelty. The fact that we adopted this policy demonstrates that this war has tested more than our nation's ability to defend ourselves. It has tested our response to our fears and the measure of our courage. It has tested our commitment to our most fundamental values and our constitutional principles. It has tested the depth of our commitment to those certain truths that our forefathers held to be self-evident. It has tested our understanding of what the terms justice, the law, the rule of law, and human rights are. It has tested our vision of what the relationship should be between the individual and government. And no less important, the war has tested our definition of human dignity. In this war, we have come to a crossroads, much as we did in the events that led to Korematsu. Will we continue to regard the protection and promotion of human dignity as the essence of our national character and purpose? Or will we bargain away human and national dignity in return for an additional possible measure of physical security? We need to be clear, cruelty disfigures our national character. It is incompatible with our constitutional order, with our laws, and our most prized values. Cruelty can be as effective as torture in destroying human dignity, and there is no moral distinction between one and the other. To adopt and apply a policy of cruelty anywhere within this world is to say that our forefathers were wrong about their beliefs in the rights of man, because there is no more fundamental right than to be safe from cruel and inhumane treatment. Where cruelty exists, law does not. Why should we care about these issues still? The Abu Ghraib abuse has been exposed. The Justice Department memoranda justifying cruelty and even torture have been ridiculed and rescinded. The authorizations for the application of extreme interrogation techniques have been withdrawn. And perhaps most critically, the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, which prohibits cruel and human and degrading treatment, has been enacted thanks to the courage and leadership of Senator John McCain, a former Profiling Courage Award recipient. We should care because the issues raised by a policy of cruelty are too fundamental to be left unaddressed, unanswered, or ambiguous. We should care because a tolerance of cruelty will corrode our values and our rights and degrade the world in which we live. It will corrupt our heritage, cheapen the valor of our soldiers whose past and present sacrifices uh, our liberties depend upon, and debase the legacy we will leave to our sons and daughters. We should care because it is intolerable for us that anyone should believe for a second that our nation is tolerant of cruelty. And we should care because each of us knows that this issue has not gone away.